Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into his fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as had any need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was also called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger there and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. When I was a little girl, there were lots of things I didn't get to do because I was too young. My brothers, who were seven and ten years older, got to do all sorts of exciting things. They would tell me stories of what they had seen or done, which was not quite as good as having the experience myself. And I would listen and try to take in the fullness of what I had missed, even while I whined about the unfairness of it all. Sometimes they would embellish the stories. They would make up stories to tell me. Over time, they included the unimaginable and the impossible. As I grew older and recognized the outrageous stories to be impossible, I could not believe. I suspect most of us have been the victim of believing some outrageous story only to find that the story told was not true. Whether it was an older sibling or a friend, when the story reached the limits of our imagination, we could not believe. One of those areas of our lives that test the strength of our faith is death. Grief, when it comes, is nothing like we expect it to be. It comes in waves that weaken the knees, blind the eyes, and obliterate the dailiness of life. In today's gospel, we find the grief-stricken disciples hiding in the upper room for fear of the Jews. Not all the Jews, of course, but those who were in authority. For some reason, Thomas was not with them. I've always wondered why. Maybe you have too. There are lots of scenarios we could offer. Maybe he was the only one brave enough to step outside to buy food and drink. Maybe he could blend in with the crowd and test the waters to find out if it was safe for the rest to leave the locked room. Maybe he simply needed to get away by himself to contemplate the events of those last days. But we don't know why. The gospel doesn't tell us. What we do know is that he wasn't there when Jesus came and stood among the disciples. Thomas, known as the twin, we know him as Doubting Thomas because he had some issues with his fellow disciples' story about seeing the risen Christ. This is the third reference to Thomas in John's Gospel. The first was when Jesus was set on going to Lazarus' home in Bethany deep in enemy territory, leading to Jerusalem and likely death. It was Thomas who said, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus sat down at the last supper and told his disciples to not be afraid, that they knew where he was going, Thomas alone said, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And we realize that it is only by Thomas's question that we could hope to understand what Jesus is saying. Later, when Jesus appeared to his disciples after his death, Thomas alone was missing. We have seen the Lord, they told him when he came back, but Thomas needed more than their testimony. Barbara Brown Taylor wonders if today Thomas would be understood to be a sensing type 
who takes in information by his five senses and trusts experiences more than words. Imagine how Jesus' metaphors must have driven him crazy. I am the bread of life. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the vine, and you are the branches. While all the intuitive type disciples were saying, oh, yes, I see, poor Thomas was probably saying, what? I don't see anything. Where is it? So Thomas is not acting out of character when he says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my fingers in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. The writer of the gospel is making an example of him for our benefit. The story about doubting Thomas is offered so that everyone from this time forward who will never have the opportunity to put our fingers into the mark of the nails in Jesus' hands or put our hands in his side might believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and have come to believe. In John's gospel, believing is fundamental, a huge deal. Mark uses the verb 13 times in his gospel, Matthew uses it nine times, and Luke seven. John uses it more than 90 times. For example, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Or 11.25, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me even though they die, will live. In chapter 14, verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. To believe is to trust what God has done in Christ and to act as if it were true. Believing is to wash another's feet, to abide in love, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Many of us can relate to Thomas's honest doubt. He is the person in the story that was most like us, and it helps us to think that someone that close to Jesus, who was right there, also had trouble believing that Jesus who had died had risen from the dead. Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and place my fingers in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. If that was a faithless thing to, th to say, Jesus wasn't put off by it. A week later, he came to that same room, to the same disciples, plus one, to repeat the words he had said before, peace be with you. Then he gave Thomas something more than he gave the others. Jesus allowed himself to be touched. What I love about this is that Jesus appears to his skeptical disciple in a body that is scarred and wounded. We live in a culture that worships artifice. All around us, people package themselves, market themselves, pummel themselves into versions of perfection that strangle their souls. If Jesus, even at the apex of his resurrection victory, showed his open wounds without shame or apology, and maybe we don't need to worry about glossy presentation. Maybe Christianity's best appeal is in its willingness to embrace real bodies, real scars, real pain. After all, it is within our bodies that we experience real trauma, deep anger, deep terror, and real joy. It is deep in my chest that hurts when I mourn. It is my face that burns when I am angry. It is my whole body that warms with pleasure when I am happy. In resurrection, Jesus honored the body. He honored the bruised, broken, wounded body. He honored the real life bodies in which we live. Our wounds aren't pretty, and they don't tell the whole story of who we are, but the stories they tell are holy. If Jesus didn't fear the bloody and the broken, then perhaps those of us walking in his footsteps don't need to fear them so much either. 
Put your finger here, he said to Thomas, so close that Thomas could smell his breath. Reach out your hand, so close that Thomas would not have to reach very far. But according to John's gospel, Thomas never did. The offer was apparently enough for him. My Lord and my God, he cried, without a doubt, becoming the last of the disciples to believe. If nothing else, Thomas reassures us that faith doesn't have to be straightforward. The business of accepting the resurrection, of living it out, of sharing it with the world is tough. It is okay to waver. It's okay to take our time. It's okay to hope for more. The encounter between Thomas and Jesus is what life looks like after the tomb. When Thomas's doubts met Jesus' wounds, new life erupted, faith blossomed, and the community grew. Resurrection happened all over again. Have you believed because you have seen me, Jesus says? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. He was talking about us, you know. He was talking to us with, that, with some kind of crazy confidence that what happened to Thomas could happen again and again, turning doubt to faith this week after the resurrection and for all the weeks to come. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he has worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who commended themselves to our prayers, especially remembering this week, Anne, Elizabeth, Gloria, Hannah, Jane, Liz Ann, Pax, Tim, Tom, and all those affected by natural disasters or human tragedies. The first responders and the aid and relief efforts that continue around the world and especially for everyone affected by the coronavirus, and on all others who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest, let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. We pray especially for peace in our homes and around the world, remembering those who have lost their homes and families to violence here and abroad, as well as those who serve and protect our own freedom. 
especially Harrison, Matt, Becky, Jennifer, Steve, Philip, Perrin, and Tony, for their safety and the just use of the power that is placed in their hands. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. I invite your petitions and thanksgivings at this time. Let us remember and pray for our pastoral care team and Stephen ministry. Risen Lord, you have commanded us to love one another and commissioned us to make disciples. Help us as we live into the fullness of your call to new life. Give us increasing capacity to share your presence and love with others, especially with our Stephen ministers and leaders. And may you give those who feel they or someone close to them would benefit from a care receiving relationship, the courage to ask for a Stephen minister to walk alongside them. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign one God, now and forever. Amen.
The Great Thanksgiving is with Eucharistic Prayer B, which begins on page 367 of the Book of Common Prayer, if you'd like to follow along. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, but chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken to the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary, the holy God-bearer, Thomas, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Using the prayer adapted by our National Cathedral, a spiritual communion is a personal devotional that anyone can pray at any time to express their desire to receive Holy Communion at, at, at that moment in which circumstances impede them from actually receiving Holy Communion physically. As we share in communion in one way or another, let us pray. Beloved Jesus, I believe that you are present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Let me never be separated from you in this life or in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and remain with you this day, this season, and forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.